Finally, we are going to have the intervention of uh, Mr. Surbier from the Netherlands, who will explain the importance of considering the different scales of urban environments to, per to perform and enable the recovery of aquif aquifer quality. And also a concept I'm curious about, the, the urban water buffer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm uh, Kun Surbier. I'm a hydrologist at the uh, KWR uh, Water Research Institute. And under the flag of Allied Waters, we, we try to cooperate with, with end users and, uh, and companies to, uh, to apply uh, managed aquifer recharge. And I will present today on a rather uh, new uh, type of ASR for us, at least, uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, I'll explain the steps we took for doing this. And it's, yes, it's focused on, first on the why. Uh, I think we all know the, the, the water shortage is one of the uh, threats also for the Netherlands uh, these days. So we expect them increase in, uh, in average rainfall, but also an increase in the duration of, of droughts. So we need more water, uh, or we need to store more water. But at the other end, we also face uh, storm events where we rapidly, where we in a very short period, have a lot of rainfall, which we weren't really used to. Uh, we were used to, to drizzles, and all the infrastructure is, is actually built just to slowly get rid of the water. And it was re never really needed to uh, to make a large discharge pipe or drainage systems, for instance. So two problems, uh, in our, mainly in our cities, uh, both drought and heat stress, also uh, an upcoming problem, and the, the pluvial flooding we have and the, the consequences it has for, uh, for, for roads, but also houses, for instance, that can flood. Well, managed aquifer recharge and a better rainwater management can provide a solution for uh, for these problems, and yeah, we are exploring how we can build something that will work for us, because we have even additional problems that, that uh, can benefit from that, uh, as we also suffer from subsidence. So houses uh, are, are impacted mainly by, uh, by, by subsidence of, of clay and peat that are uh, well present in large parts of our country. And as groundwater levels go down, then subsidence tend to, to cause damage, uh, especially uh, on the foundations of, of the houses. And that costs a lot of money. Now, why did we run into these, uh, these problems? Well, one reason is, is that in, in, in uh, the design of cities, that, that there is a change in, in how we manage water from a natural situation where a large part infiltrates and evaporates. We've created a system where a large part is uh, quickly discharged from the city, so it's, it's runoff uh, dominated and only a small part still infiltrates uh, to the soil and is available for evapotranspiration. So the objective was uh, to restore uh, aquifer advancement or infiltration towards uh, the deeper groundwater uh, uh, aquifers, uh, but in the city itself, so in these dense urban areas where we have the problems to get rid of the water quickly. And at the same time, uh, also try to benefit from the water you infiltrate and store uh, for later use uh, in this at the same location. Not for drinking water, but for other urban purposes. So what we came up with together with, with, with some uh, companies, uh, industrial designers, architects, and, and uh, consultancies uh, was a system where we had actually a couple of steps following each other to, to deal with both the, the surplus of water, so we needed some retention, but we also needed quality improvement. If you look at the rainwater quality in the Netherlands, then it's uh, chemically, it it's, uh, doesn't have the quality to inject directly into an aquifer, uh, but we needed to inject it deeper. Uh, like, like I mentioned, the shallower uh, geological layer, they consist of clay mainly and peat, and they, are, well, they do not provide any opportunity to, to really infiltrate the water at surface level. So we needed to go deeper to more fluvial sand layers, and therefore we also needed a better treatment to both uh, ensure that the groundwater quality is not threatened, but also to prevent the clogging of the infiltration well. We are testing this at a, a site in the city of Rotterdam, uh, which, is, uh, uh, the, which are the surroundings of a, uh, a football stadium, and it's surrounded by a paved area uh, where there is now a rainwater collection system 
it was already there and it used to, to, to uh, flush uh, the water or discharge the water to a surface water system, which would then often uh, overflow. So they had problems to get the water out of the, of the system via the surface water. And now the water is, uh, is kept in a, in a retention basin from the system. And in total, it's about 45,000 uh, uh, square meters that could contribute to this rainwater collection system. Now in an overview uh, from step one to five, step one is, is actually the collection of the, of the rainwater uh, from the streets uh, with all the contaminants and all the solids still in there. And that water is first retained in an in a underground basin because uh, when there is such an extreme stormwater event, we do not have the infiltration or injection capacity to, to quickly bring it to the aquifers. So we have to retain it first, make sure the water doesn't end up at the streets. And in the third step, we start treating the water. And uh, I will uh, show some uh, details on, on the uh, mechanism we built for that. But it's based on a slow sand filtration, biofiltration of the, of the the water coming from that underground basin. It's then, uh, in the fourth step, uh, injected uh, actually under gravity to uh, 15 to 30 meters deep sand layer. And from there, actually from almost the same well, uh, but uh, not exactly, we inject the water uh, deep in the aquifer and we recover it uh, at the top, and I'll show later why. But from the shallow well, the water can be abstracted back again, and it's used for irrigation of uh, the grass the field in a uh, football stadium, and that's actually artificial grass, not natural grass, so it doesn't need uh, the water to grow, but it needs the water to be able to play on the field. I didn't know that as well. So the numbers uh, based uh, or dependent if it's a wet or a dry year, we collect about 15,000 to 30,000 uh, cubic meter a year, and we supply around 10,000 cubic meter per year to the stadium. And this 10,000 cubic meter per year, they normally uh, uh, supply with drinking water. So supply from, of the rainwater comes instead of the drinking water that they normally use. Now some images. This is where the, the underground uh, basin is, is uh, situated. It's under a playground that's on the square for the, for the children. But underneath is a, a system that's uh, created from, from boxes made of plastic and it's uh, covered in uh, soil, so it's an impermeable, uh, yeah, actually a basement of uh, our underground tank, and it holds around uh, 1,400 cubic meters, so half a swimming pool is, uh, is there underground. Then some images of the, the pretreatment, which is, uh, well, after an oil separator, it's, uh, it's a structure like this. It's made out of, uh, out of sand. It's uh, a sand layer of about one meters, and it has uh, the characteristics more of a slow sand filter, as we know from, from, from water treatment. But there are plants in there, uh, not really to, to, to do a lot of treatment, but, but mainly to make it more appealing for, uh, for the location where it's situated, because it's right in the middle of a residential area. So some images, uh, it can be either wet or dry. So when uh, we have the rainwater available, uh, the water is distributed on this, this a yeah, small wetland in, the, in that area uh, via a gutter system which is uh, surrounding the whole, uh, the whole plot actually. So it's integrated in this, uh, in this uh, feature. Then the next step, uh, designed together with uh, the people uh, living there, so, so they were involved actually in how and where all the elements should uh, be placed. And that was an exciting uh, journey, I would say, and I think it's also an important thing for us to learn as we want to apply MAR in an urban area, then it should be visible. Uh, as technicians, we normally make things out of sight, but here by making elements of the, of the pretreatment and the, and, the, and the installation visible was actually uh, for, for the neighborhood uh, important because it was a, a bit dull, it was all paved, and now we could finally make something more nice out of that. Uh, that square. So there is a, a water feature, it's like a, like a fountain more or less, where, where water that is recovered, so part of the water, so not all water is brought back to the stadium, but part is brought to this, uh, this fountain. So marketing, you could, you could say.
some errors appeared here uh, from the well to the, the, to the wetland system in dry, or actually daily, uh, a part of the, the water that is stored in the aquifer is brought back to this, uh, this small wetland to make sure it doesn't become too dry or that plants will die off, but also to, to refresh the system a bit such that water will not stand still for, for too long in, in the system. So every day, the, the submersible pump in the, in the well switches on, brings the water to the, to the filter, and after that, the, the, the water is brought back into the, to the aquifer. So there's continuous motion actually in the system to, to, to make sure it keeps refreshing itself, more or less. Now, there's a small uh, SCADA system to, to operate it all and to, to, to make sure that we uh, obtain the data we want to, to, to have, because we do try to learn from the system uh, at the moment mainly. So it has a system that, that actually notifies when there is water coming into this uh, retention basin and then when it reaches a certain set point, uh, the water is being brought to the, the treatment, after the treatment brought to the injection well. And whenever they want to spray the field, irrigate the field, then the pump automatically switches on and, and supplies the water. Now, some background on the, on the geology. We are situated in a fluvial aquifer, uh, about, uh, well, like I mentioned, 15 to 30 meters deep. It's uh, a river deposit, so medium coarse sand to coarse sand, sometimes a bit of gravel. And on top is the, uh, are the, uh, the more uh, deposits like more from a lagoonal setting, so clays, uh, peat, and sometimes a bit of sand, and the rest is uh, anthropogenic in light gray. It's a meter below sea level, and it is in our coastal zone, so the, the groundwater is, is, is brackish, 700 to 1500 uh, milligrams per liter chloride. And it's deeply anoxic. To the, the north, we have the, the, the more, even more shallow polders, where we have the brackish uh, seepage of, the, of this groundwater from these uh, deeper aquifers towards the, the surface water. There's not much horizontal or lateral flow, it's, it's rather stagnant. And this is how we build up the well, and the people visited the last couple of ISMARs uh, have seen it before. We, we, we made two sections, one for injection, a bit deeper in the aquifer, and the, the, the well for recovery is actually at the top, and it's not too long. And the reason that we, we build it up like this is that we want to win back or recover as much fresh water as we can. And since we are injecting rainwater in a brackish aquifer, it has a tendency to move up. So there's a buoyancy effect there. And by injecting uh, the water uh, deeper and recovering it at the top, we can still recover a large part of the water. Not all, some you will lose because it will be out of reach, but still a large part here you can recover most of the water. So how did we proceed? We, we are monitoring all the elements that are uh, in, the, in the whole scheme. And uh, for instance, now we are looking at the, the filling level of the of the basin, of the, of the rainwater basin, so it actually gathers the water when there is rainfall. We also see the rainfall data. You see during rainfall events, it, it quickly fills up, so it reaches a high level, and by injecting the water after treatment, we can lower the basin again, such it, that it can await the next event of, uh, of rainfall. In a pilot, it, uh, it's not always operating uh, as it should from the start, so when you have a software problem, like in the SCADA system, then the, the one overflow still occurs, but yeah, that is like a trial and error sometimes to, to get it really solidly operating. But in general, we're very happy. We can quickly lower the level in the basin and make it available to, for the next uh, stormwater event. Now, in total, we have uh, injected uh, almost 7,000 uh, cubic meter uh, by now, uh, and in the period we are testing it, and that's from September, October last year, we have had around 400 millimeters of rain. And if you do, do the math, then we have, well, we collect about half of the rainfall in that area. So the, the other half uh, is either not properly connected to the, to the rainwater collection system, or is trapped somewhere and doesn't reach our system at all. We have recovered about 20% up to now, but yeah, we are actually now coming into the, the moment that, that most recovery should take place. So this is the moment that the, the irrigation system is used uh, most often. Some loss of the injection capacity of the well. Uh, one of the uh, 
The biggest concerns we have is actually clogging of the infiltration of the injection well. The rainwater has a uh, uh, high solid, uh, uh, high amount of uh, suspended solids, uh, high turbidity, and also uh, uh, high BDOCs. So the, tenden, the, the risk is that this, this injection well will quickly uh, clog. And it is what we noticed uh, at the start uh, when we were injecting uh, at the end of 2018, but uh, recently the, the injection capacity is rather stable. I will try, I will elaborate on, on the biggest uh, well, causes for this uh, clogging of the well actually in the, in the next, uh, next slides. Some images of the, of the water quality. Uh, I made a, a quick uh, selection and also I listed uh, the main uh, legal limits that were set to inject the water and also the operational limits we would uh, we normally use for, for injection of the water via a well. And you see, for instance, that turbidity is still relatively high, although the, the pretreatment does a, a, a good job. It's still not up to a level that we would say, well, you can, without any problem, you can inject this into, a, into an injection well. We do see that it is performing better and better. So a sand filter like that uh, need to clog itself or make a cake layer first before it really does uh, the best job. Further on, we see a lot of iron and manganese coming from the, the rainwater system, a bit higher than we normally see in, in, in rainwater collection systems in the Netherlands. And also ammonium and, and even sometimes chloride and, and sodium are, are, are sometimes high in, in the concentration. And also zinc. But zinc we, we can easily can, can remove sufficiently. It can get below the, the, the limit that I set. But the other ones are of concern and we relate their presence to the inflow of, uh, of shallow groundwater from that clay layer that is on top of the, of the target aquifer into this pipe system that uh, is discharging the rainwater. And that is confirmed by, by camera inspections and also by, uh, by mapping of, of the concentrations in that system. When you have a rainwater system uh, such as that in, in, in such an environment, you can uh, well, be sure that at some point it will leak somewhere or that a connection is made that, that should not be made. So we hoped for lower concentrations of, of iron and manganese mainly uh, to prevent clogging uh, of the injection well, but they are still rather high and not sufficiently removed by the pretreatment we have set up. Now also this uh, inflow actually of uh, of shallow groundwater was confirmed by, by what we see in the electroconductivity of the, of the water that is in the basin. During dry moments, like the, the, the summer we had in 2018, the, SA, the electroconductivity goes up, and when there is rainfall, it quickly goes down. So the system is flushed with rainwater, and the, the more saline water is actually uh, flushed out. And when it's drier again, we see this electrical conductivity go up again. So there's a larger contribution again of this, this water leaking into the, the rainwater system. And even in, on moments where it's not raining, we see the water coming into this, uh, to this basin. So it's continuously coming in, and especially the iron concentrations uh, are well, burying for us. And such, such, uh, or for that reason, we made some adjustment uh, in the pretreatment. What we added was uh, iron-coated sand. I show a picture uh, after this, but it helped us to remove more of the, of the iron from the, uh, uh, the rainwater. So it seems at least for now. We have one measurement uh, after we, we made the modification. Now, one measurement isn't really a measurement, but we will have to see how this evolves. But the first result is that, that, that way more uh, iron is removed actually from the incoming rainwater such that we have a cleaner water to, to bring to the injection well. Also, most of the iron, by the way, is, is dissolved. It's not in, in particles, but as dissolved form. This is more or less how it looks. This is the, uh, the iron-coated sand. It's, it's actually a byproduct of uh, uh, the, the iron removal we have uh, at groundwater abstraction wells uh, further inland, where the iron is removed uh, by uh, aeration and uh, filtration and then the water is used for, for drinking water mainly. At some point, such a sand filter is, is clogged, too much iron has precipitated, and then the material is, uh, is used, for instance, for 
for, for things like this. Now I showed a bit of the, of the chemical quality. Uh, an aspect we are looking further into is also the, the microbial uh, water quality. Because we are using the water at the fountain, uh, part of it is, is uh, irrigated in a, in a football stadium. And we want to know more about uh, the risks that there can be for uh, people present in the stadium, people there playing with the water. So we now have, uh, have grab samples of the, of, the, of, the, of the quality, and we see that uh, if the water has a very short residence time, so rainfall is falling, we are injecting it, and, and at the same time, or almost at the same time, we are uh, taking it out of the aquifer, then the, 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 the levels are still quite high, not, not uh, alarming, but, but we see that there is at least no removal in the aquifer of, uh, of the pathogens that are in the, in the incoming water. If there is a drought, so no rainwater is injected, uh, then we see that, that we can, by the uh, storage in the aquifer, uh, get, attain much lower values and have a much more safer situation. But in the next step, we will uh, dive into this and, and have more actually numbers on the removal versus time. So how many days should the water be in the aquifer before it's really safe? And also to uh, evaluate, well, how much water uh, may a child, if he's playing with with the fountain, or if someone is present in, present in the stadium while they are irrigating the pitch, uh, take in, and together that will uh, help us to make uh, the risk assessment. We have some standards for that in the Netherlands. For instance, for for of course for drinking water, we accept a certain risk, and also for for uh, swimming water. So if you swim in natural waters, there are guidelines for that. It seems to me that we are way below the, the risk that you have uh, for, uh, when you go swimming in, in the natural water, but uh, that we are, of course, not providing drinking water. Somewhere in between. Now, we like to replicate uh, uh, systems one, when we think, well, okay, this is something we can, uh, we can work with. So we are exploring new sites, uh, amongst others uh, here uh, in Spain, uh, in, in Valladolid. Uh, about three hours drive uh, from Madrid. But also, and that's uh, in the upper right, uh, uh, to connect it to drainage systems we have in the uh, areas where we have uh, the most problems with uh, subsidence. And in this step, we, we will not use the water for uh, irrigation, but we will bring back the water to the drainage system to make sure that the, the phreatic groundwater level goes up a bit and that subsidence will be at least less than it is right now. And the other one, and that's at the bottom right, is, is to use the water for irrigation in, in parks. Uh, there is a big challenge in the Netherlands to, to make uh, the cities greener, uh, and that's mainly to, to prevent uh, heat stress in, in very hot summers. Therefore, you need, uh, we think of parks, but parks need water if they really want to cool down the area. And this can be a way or a means of providing that water with the proper quality. So to conclude, uh, yeah, we think that local ASR can be a viable means to prevent both fluvial flooding, so pre provide extra uh, routes to discharge the water instead of using or, or building an extra pipeline out of the city, and also to provide fresh water during drought. Now, as we saw, the, the system is rather young, and the first data is now coming in, so it's all not perfect yet, and I hope that we can show you the, the results and the analysis of what we are observing in the next, uh, next ISMAR. Work in progress. The water quality of, of the water that we receive definitely requires treatment, uh, both to protect the groundwater quality. We do observe uh, exceedances, for instance, for the zinc, but also of some other uh, element. So treatment is, is, is vital. Uh, you need to remove uh, some of the substances, but also to prevent clogging of the well, so particles, need to be removed, iron reeds need to be removed, uh, all to ensure uh, continuous operation of such an injection well. Microbial risk assessment, also essential. If you want to do this in the middle of the city, there is something to consider there. And one of the considerations is to, to not use ASR in the form we do right now, but to, to switch to ASTR and make sure that there is more aquifer residence uh, always. So the last, to conclude, and I think that's the lessons for many of us uh, is, is 
to use the word uh, yeah, marketing, I'd call it. If you build such thing in a city, in, in a city, people don't know more, so you have to work hard on your marketing, make it appealing, and make sure that you do your communication and education. With that, uh, I conclude. This was a slide we all used uh, during this conference, but uh, the, the stand is closed, uh, I think, by now. So if you want to know more, please visit us uh, online. And uh, thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Cohen. Uh, is there any question? Yeah, in the front. Yeah, in the front. Yes, thank you. In your animation, uh, you showed the animation with mm -hmm. this, this co co bubble of fresh water, right? So, which is uh, yep. di dynamics. Is it uh, a result of modeling simulations? If yes, uh, what, what kind of model? And have you yep. calibrated the model? And, and uh, Here, the model collaboration is, uh, calibration is still underway, but we did this a lot at, uh, in the agriculture. Mm -hmm. So, there is a PhD thesis uh, available with the calibrated model on these. Uh, on the use of such wells for mm -hmm. ASR in uh, in Brack's yeah. Thanks. Yeah. There's another question there. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to check the electrical conductivity of the water um, that you showed there was, I think, 760 mm -hmm. microsiemens per centimeter rainwater. Yeah and then treated as well, but then the reclaimed water was yep. lower? It was lower, yeah. Yeah, what, do you know why that is, if it's a brackish aquifer? I know why it is, yeah. It's okay. because it, uh, what, what I show in the injection or in the uh, pre-treated, or in the before the treatment and after treatment is uh, a series of, uh, that's starting from September until uh, now, more or less. And in the beginning, the electric conductivity was rather high uh, following the, the dry summer. Uh, then we started injecting and the electric conductivity became much lower, but we had already had these, these samples in the data. So the average of the injection water is still rather high, but the water we are recovering is, is younger than this first water with this high uh, electric electrical conductivity. So it, it's a time effect actually, yeah. Last in, first out, yeah. There's another question there. Hello, Bob Bauer, New Zealand. I, I might have missed it. Um, how does it compare to whatever information you collected before you built the system? Um, what, as, what aspect? The Any of it. Were the, the, the surprises, so to say, were the, mainly the, the incoming water quality, so the, the composition of that. Yep. Uh, the aquifer itself was not really different from what we expected, that, but that is, in the Netherlands, we have quite good data of, uh, of the aquifers, especially in the, in the shallow zone and especially in the cities. So was there site characterization done before it was constructed? No. Not at all? No. There okay. is a, an extensive database uh, in the Netherlands. So the, the first uh, well in the database was actually about 20 meters from this site. And it was well uh, descriptive. Yeah. That's luxury. You don't always have. No. Uh, can you elaborate more in the cost part, uh, looking at the initial cost and also the operation cost uh, per cubic meter for say, or like for season mm -hmm. or for a storm? I can't. That's the, the true question. Because we, yeah, this is something on the revaluation. It was really a pilot. And yeah, we see a lot of aspects that we will not include in the next, uh, next version. So it is an exercise we are doing at the moment. So what of this whole setup would you still use in the next version and how expensive it will be. But this one is uh, ridiculously expensive. So we won't make this, uh, no city will make this uh, like this again, but we have ways of, uh, of making it yeah, more lean, let's say. And especially expensive here was this uh, system with uh, the plastic boxes under the playground to store all this water. If you have a better solution for that, then it really becomes interesting because the infiltration part the recovery part, that's not the most expensive, but to store this 50 millimeters of rainfall shortly, that was the challenge. But next is Mar. I will uh, also shout numbers on this. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes, there's another one here. Yes, the microphone. And your analysis. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. 
soda le llega a pierde de zinc with 50 milligrams mm -hmm. per quad. Microbits. Can you go to, to the table? Is the presentation still here? Sorry, can, can we have the presentation again, please? Maybe in Spanish. <laughs> in Spanish. <laughs> ¿Nos podéis poner la presentación otra vez, por favor? You can see. Suddenly appear. There. In the treated, appear 50, 50 milligrams. It's going into the aquifer, yeah. It should be below 65 to meet the requirements. Why? That is the, the background level in our aquifers. From, from where? From, from the aquifer? That is... Uh, Sink? So much? Yeah. It's much, no? You can review. It's too much. It is microgram, yeah. It's microgram, eh, in the, in the graph. Mm -hmm. But so much is in the incoming water from the, from the street, yeah? Especially when you involve a roof in the in, in the collection system, then, then these are concentrations you end up with. Is there any other questions? No, I have Thank you. one. No, very good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Are you with with that uh, amount of uh, water stored in the in those in that plastic uh, basin. Mm -hmm. Have you got any problem in the surrounding uh, buildings, in the in the basements? Buildings. Yeah. No, not because really. the, it, it changes, no? The, the yeah, it must be there is movement, but there has been pre-consolidation as well oh, because okay. it's it's been dug in. Mm -hmm. uh, in Rotterdam, the the first two meter is is sand, but it's mm -hmm. artificially uh, put on top to, to make a, a foundation more or less. Okay. So most of the soils are pre-consolidated. Okay. So there's no change in, the, in really the weight that's on top of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have to finish here. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> it was the last one, and now at seven o'clock we have the um, closing ceremony. So we uh, we will see you here in five minutes, and that's the finishing of the, that session. Thank you, everybody.